you know, I'm very conscious um, that thankful people are happy people and I'm very conscious to be happy because I'm blessed. I'm so blessed. I wake up, I can walk along the ocean and I find the water really soothing. I find that I take a lot of solace from that, like it levels me. If I was, to be honest, anything, selling anything, I would start building my following yesterday. Hello there, Laban Ditchburn, host of the Become Your Own Superhero podcast. Welcome to another amazing episode today, folks. I have an amazing woman who has sold more recipe books then you've had hot dinners and all of your lineage put together. And the irony is that those hot dinners were probably the result of four ingredients. Ladies and gentlemen, Kim McCosker. Oh, thank you very much. Four ingredients, Laban, is all you need. Kim, before we kick things off, your boy did a little bit of recon on some important people in your life. Oh. And there's, there's two quotes I want to read. One is... I've never met anyone more selfless or generous than Kim, not just to her boys and husband, but to random people in the street that she sees as needing help or a pick-me-up. And that's by a bloke by the name of Glenn Turnbull. You know who that is? I do know that. I do know him very, very well. Yes. Who's that? Did I pay him to write that? <laughs> Did you pay him to write that? I haven't had to see the many money sent this out of the goodness of his heart. <laughs> oh, it's beautiful. Like, I mean, he's very support. He's my husband, obviously. He's um of 20 years, very supportive and always has been. But um, it's lovely to hear those couple of sentences condensed. It's it's nice to know that your family think that way about you, isn't it? It's well, beautiful. I said I write, I spoke to him this morning. Two. I secretly spoke to him this morning. And and I said, I, you know, I presume there is a lot of compliments and a lot of feedback and support and and but it's nice to hear it from a third party sometimes because I like hearing it from someone that's not my wife oh do you know what I mean well, so, it's also equally nice to hear it you know you get so busy in life with your children with work with you know hobbies and then what we do for community as well which is very near and dear to my heart you sometimes don't take the time to actually tell each other because you know sometimes you can take it for granted a little I guess you know, he knows I think he's special and that. But, yeah, it's really lovely. It's very touching to hear it read back or said. Well, you are very welcome. I've got one more for you as well. Oh. North Burnett Regional Council, which includes Mandabara, <laughs> are excited for her life's achievements in her cooking recipes and also her commitment to her husband and children. On behalf of council members, and the North Burnett community, I congratulate Kim on her achievements and wish her continued success in her cooking career. Regards, Les Hots, Mia, North Burnett Regional Council. Really? I don't even think I've met Les. <laughs> well, Les has met me, and oh, I, I no. let him know that you were coming today to share your story with our amazing audience. And I said, what would you like to say to Kim? Oh, that's so sweet. I mean, North Burnet, well, those mandarins and lemons that I just, you can tell less, well, from North Burn, well, they're actually Central Burnet, Gainder. But they are very parochial and they just love four ingredients. They love the notion that it was born there or that, you know, I was born there and then we, you know, really a lot of the original book, the recipes I sourced from people because mum and dad were living there at the time and my aunts and uncles you know so I sourced a lot of the recipes in my very first book from people in the you know north central and south Burnett region which is for those listening wide bay it's up sort of near Bundaberg runs north of Gympie all the way you know sort of Bundaberg and inland so that's wide burn wide bay region north burn south burn and now central. sitting across from ditch burn <laughs> Isn't that fantastic? Burn the baby full, bird. The full circle. <laughs> so, folks, Kim has sold in excess of 9 million books, recipe books or books in general at time of recording. This is May 2024. Yeah, probably about 6 million to the Burnett region. God bless you. <laughs> <laughs> and if you see in the background, uh, we've, we've positioned a couple of, uh, one of many um, books that Kim has available currently. And if you're listening to this, 
get on the video and check this out. This is we've got the, this beautiful woman in pink today, and really, my opinion of you, Kim, is I think you're one of the best marketers on planet Earth, and I'd be keen to hear your thoughts on that. Oh, well, that's a compliment coming from you and all the amazing people you've met in your travels, your journeys. I have always been in sales. So I actually did a degree in university, um, international finance, a Bachelor of International Finance. And I was lucky enough to get a graduate position with a big funds management company called MLC that was bought by one of the big four banks, NAB, in January 2000. And I was in sales. You know, and it doesn't matter who you are and what you do, everyone is in sales. We work very closely with the CEO of the National Breast Cancer Foundation based in Sydney. He's in sales. My next door neighbour is a neurosurgeon. He's in sales. You know, I'm part of the Calandra Chamber of Commerce. They're in sales. Everyone is vying for your membership, you know, your dollar, your support, your following, your like. We're all in sales. And once you're down with that, once you realise what you are selling and how you can best describe it to your audience and connect the benefit, sky's the limit. So when I had a cookbook that the entire trade said, well, that's never going to sell, I had to upskill myself in the art of selling books. So previously I was selling superannuation. So Laban, 17 years ago, far more versed in the complexities of superannuation than shepherd's pie, but you know, at the time I was a mum of, um, you know, three little boys and I had to get food on the table fast at the end of a busy day and just wanted a really easy kitchen tool, a Bible really, that could help me do that. And that's where Four Ingredients came into being. It's had such an amazing, inspiring story. And part of the reason I wanted to bring you on today, Kim, was largely around the inspiring uh, component of your story where and I only learned this in my research of you, where you were basically knocking door to door selling the books. What's what's that? Ex what was that experience like for you? So on March 17, St. Paddy's Day 2007, a lorry backed up to my um, front door with two and a half pallets of cookbooks. So mental note, when you do decide, oh, well, you've already written a bestseller, but... For those listening, if you want to write write a book and you do order 2,000, they will be delivered in two and a half pallets and you've got to house them somewhere. So, you know, as just a, 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 a typical mother who went, right, well, here's a problem, what do I do to solve it? I literally had a double pram with my two eldest, one was four, one was one at the time, and I took everything out of the base of the pram that you would find and I loaded it up with cookbooks and I, I literally went door to door. But remember to... There was method to my madness because at that point I'd been putting this book together, the original manuscript, for over a year and my neighbours knew all about it. You know, the mothers at mum's group knew about it, the tennis club knew about it, the swimming mums knew about it, everyone knew about it. So I knew if I went door knocking, they were all going to buy two, three, four, five copies for everyone that they knew. So it wasn't like I was... I did cold, you know, door knock a lot, but I also knew that I would sell a lot doing this. But I would do that at the end of working when I had my kids. We could do that together, and I do that on weekends. But what I would do at night time is I would write my press release. I would send it out. I had a map of Australia, and I would send it out. Like so, I started with Brisbane because that's where I was living. And I would send it out to the local newspaper. Then I'd send it out to the local radio stations. Then I'd send it out to the Courier Mail, which is our statewide. And because I did come from sales, I knew that I was just one press release they were getting on any given day at any given moment. So I knew I had to follow up. Hi, I'd send it, email it to the chief of staff or the editor or the executive producer, EP, whoever it was. And then I would follow up. Hi, I sent an email and it's about this cookbook. It's going to revolutionize people's lives in the kitchen. It's going to save time and money. It's amazing. It's called Four Ingredients. And they'd say, no, I didn't see it. Yeah, yeah, saw it. Yeah, yeah, quite interested. And that's how little by little by little the marketing, you know, perpetuated. So I originally had, and I've got it printed and framed on my wall in my office at Moffat Beach, the very first editorial we ever had, you know, and I had a big chicken and vegetable pie and I had a beautiful strawberry flummery, four ingredients, two ingredients, and they were the two recipes 
that made it into print. And then as fortune would have it, um, the producer of a very popular ABC breakfast show at the time, Spencer Housen was, I think, oh God, the highest rating breakfast, breakfast radio announcer in Queensland 10 years in a row. She read it and went, oh my God, we have to have this girl on. Spencer, we've got to have her on. So me and me thinking it might be the last radio show I ever get on, I baked like Little Red Riding Hood. I baked this basket of beautiful, I had muffins <laughs> and cakes and apples, strudels, all these things, recipes from the book. And I took it in and that was genius because obviously Breakfast Radio, they're up at three. He's been in studio since four. By 6.30 when I got there, peak hour, he's starving. So he's eating and I've just got, I'm open slather with the microphone. So I am just telling everybody about the benefit of four ingredients and how it's going to revolutionize time in the kitchen and simplify your day at the end of a, a busy day after a long commute home, just four ingredients, season stir and dinner's done. So by the time I'd finished that, which was really only scheduled for three minutes, but because I took this big basket of beautifully <laughs> freshly baked things that they were eating and trying and discussing, it extended to nearly six minutes, nearly double the time slot. So every, you think of all the thousands of radio interviews I've done since I've baked for every single one, lesson number one on that very first one. But by the time I got back to my car, I had had the EP, the executive producer of a show called Extra at the time. And for Queenslanders, longstanding Queenslanders, that used to be a half hour show that ran into the six o'clock news in Queensland statewide. Everyone watched Extra and everyone tuned in to Channel 9 news of a night time. And the cooking component of Extra used to just be a couple of minutes in the middle of the segment, so about quarter to six. But the day they came to film at my house, I had made over 30 things. I had hired these single um, crystal vases that ran the whole centre of my table with a single long stemmed red rose. Like it was like royalty was coming. Like my boys were so excited. Every, and it was the first time I'd ever had anything to do with the TV production or anything at all with TV. So I thought there would be lighting and sound and makeup. And, you know, I just thought there'd be a cast of thousands. You know, well, two people walked in. And, you know, that was that was it and all this food. So it was just so beautifully. They shot it so beautifully. The light was coming in just at the right angle. It was all just worked out. And they then, it worked out perfectly, so much so that they took the cooking component this one particular night out of the centre of that half hour and they made it the five-minute run into the 6 o'clock news, which is when those that aren't watching extra were turning over so I had this massive amount of eyes on my story. And, you know, it just it just snowballed because the more I did, the more that came my way. You know, it's like that old saying, the harder you work, the luckier you, you get. Amen. That was that was me at the start of Four Ingredients. It was just, and as luck would have it, that night, Big W were having a statewide conference in the CBD of Brisbane. And the book buyer, who is still the same book buyer today, Meredith, God bless her, very, very influential in book buying trade in Australia, uh, she saw it and she rang and she ordered a 1,000 copies, so half the copies. And once Big W, so they're a big DDS, a discount department store, so you've got Big W, Kmart, Target, et cetera. Once one does something, the others, it's like dominoes. So literally, yeah, within that sort of first four, five, six weeks, our original 2000 print run that was never going to sell, that was sitting on two and a half pallets in my living room, were gone. Wow. So, and then it just, do, 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 do. yeah, snowballed. But it was, it snowballed and continued to because we were relentless. We would ring and ring and email and constantly, like you said, never took no for an answer. You know, it took us nearly from that March to the June to get on a morning breakfast show. Yeah, just relentless. Here's a doozy for you. Well, may, maybe not, but I think it might be. If Because this was about 2006, 2007. Seven. If you were to, to start the exact same process in 2024, how would you go about it with the obviously the difference in technology and everything that's shifted? So obviously in 2007, I mean, Facebook was only born in a Harvard dorm in 2004. I think 
by the time we'd published, I only knew one person with Facebook. So social media was really non-existent. It was traditional. It was traditional marketing. It was newspapers, radio, and it was um, TV. That was it. So, but if I was starting to publish now, if I was, to be honest, anything, selling anything, I would start building my following yesterday. Because even if you are lucky enough to get a publishing deal, that will generally only come your way if you have a following, because Mm -hmm. the publisher can see you have an immediate market. And that's what they're looking for. They're looking for, okay, who can I partner with that can help me sell this? Because if you can't sell it as the author, then they've got the responsibility solely. And it's a really tough market. Like I'm I'm living proof any nutter can write a book. So <laughs> I can do it. Like literally anyone can write a book. So, you know, what you need is a competitive ant, like an edge when you go to the publishers or when you go to market is an automatic following because there's an automatic income. And if the book or the product or the service is beneficial to that person, that's gold because they then become your marketing manager as well. And that's sort of, you know, once I realized that distribution in Australia is very difficult, like I had a website and no publishing deal, I had big W. So what I needed to do was to be able to, you know, you needed to be able to find a way to get your product as easily to, from, you know, Chermside, a kilometre from where I live to Cairns to Kalgoorlie, you know, and that, yeah, that took a whole lot of, you know, strategy. And I to do that, social media is paramount. And, that, you know, if I was writing or, you know, innovating today, I would, if I'm working on anything, I would be building my 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 business you know I would be building that online yeah following ASAP everything you do everywhere you go please follow please follow please like please like and word of mouth is still by far the strongest most powerful meaningful form of marketing there is and I really asked that question for myself by the way uh, because when uh, about two weeks before the book was due to be released at the end of 2021 and it's an addiction recovery memoir self-help book. Yep. So the, the topic and the theme is... Niche. To say the least. Yep. Right? And quite confronting for many people as well. And that's okay. There's there's a, there's an audience for that. But two weeks before the book's due to come out, the publisher said, oh, my God, I'm so sorry. I forgot to send you the launch strategy, which for any uh, aspiring authors, you typically need at least like six to 12 months prior to the book being released is yeah. the best of my knowledge Kenny your thoughts on that so I had to improvise very quickly and as a result we ended up getting about 100 people on a zoom and doing a book launch and it ended up being we were in Mexico we wouldn't have any family around that and that was fine but it it didn't get the launch that I believe that it should have and so I want to redeem that and I also don't want to pay to have a bestseller I don't want to buy yeah. the votes and you know, cause you can pay to become a New York times bestseller. And there's, you know, I'm not all about that life. And the book is really good. Not just my opinion. I've had some wonderful endorsements from people that are very well known and, and people that are just regular Joes as well. So one of the, but one of the challenges that I experienced with the YouTube channel, which is where we released these interviews is during uh, COVID, there was quite a bit of censorship that I experienced just because of some of the guests that I'd chosen to interview. And much of which the information has now been vindicated. And a few of these people have been on Joe Rogan's um, podcast. And what's interesting, Kim, is I just created a TikTok account um, recently, posted my first video two days ago, and then my second one yesterday, and it had 40,000 <gasps> views. Okay, that's massive. That's fantastic. Right. Right, maybe perhaps I should come over and do a TikTok with you and <laughs> something at the same time and co-promote. That's good. That's smart. You know, I mean, and if, yeah, anything like that because there's so many and that is basically just your time. That's your time. So, but no one's going to market it better than you. So I just think, no, if you can do more of that and if that's working for you, then, oh, my gosh. Go. That's great. That's gold. It was um, it was incredible. It's the most viral thing I've ever done. Yeah, with... Look at it. Yeah. And see, that's an interesting, <laughs> that's almost like if that was me, I'd be writing a little quick, you know, 
paragraph about that, and then I'd be putting that out across Instagram and Facebook because that's huge numbers. Everyone who creates a TikTok wants to get 40,000 views in 24 hours. You're lucky to get 1,000. Again, yeah. it's saturated. How do you cut through? It's never been easier to publish something but never been harder to be heard. So, I mean, however you did that, that's try and keep that ball rolling. Get another thing with the same hashtags out there sooner rather than later don't let momentum fall well i've done a follow-up video and the, the book had nothing the the video had nothing to do with the book it was a story about when anna and i were in melbourne 2019 and we were returning home after watching a movie and a very drunk very tall guy did something inappropriate to anna and it was the way that i responded i didn't hit the guy i just there was the the guttural noise that came out of my being Oh, that, anger. And, and the blood drained from this gentleman and he, he backed off immediately. He knew that he made a mistake. So it was, and I recorded it with no shirt on out there. Oh, <laughs> like, no, you were in me. <laughs> so it's like here, it's here above. <laughs> so I have zero clue about what are the parameters that make a, a TikTok viral, but um, you're hundred percent right to be able to incorporate that loop that around to people that are struggling with addiction to get that. What about, reaching out more to the um, the 12 step, the uh, addiction helpline, the gamblers helpline that, yep. which I've done a little bit of, but what are your thoughts? Well, and the other thing, right? So here's, here's my belief as a mum of three boys. Um, addiction and especially to gambling is coming to that age group, that demographic in Australia, because everything, every sporting, you know, boys love sport. And as a mum, you've got your boys into sport to keep them off the street and out of trouble. A busy boy, you know, was a good boy generally. Mm -hmm. So now their love of sports, they'll watch anything. They'll watch the ping pong final in Korea. They'll watch horse racing in Kentucky. They'll watch running, you know, they'll watch anything. They're looking forward to the Olympics. But everything you watch, sports bet, points bet, tab court, multi buys, multi this, We'll bet now and we'll guarantee you your money. But like it is just saturating their psyche. And I think, oh, my gosh, you know, they're not mature enough to know that the house always wins. Like I just think, oh, you probably, you, you know, you, you're, you've written what you've written. And addiction's addiction, you know, the, sim, the signs, you know, I just think that the addiction to gambling is coming. That, that's just my gut feel. I just think. You know, I was talking to my bankers and they were saying the real problem they're seeing at the moment is uh, the addiction of tradies to slot machines. What are they called? Pokies. Pokies, yeah. Like the, the physical pokies? The they're physical going pokies. in and they're going to the pub, they're buying their, you know, they're buying their drink and then they're going in and they're spending the fastest growing uses of pokies are tradies. And I just think my because my elder son's an electrician, so that just, so then I go straight home and I say, Right, Morgan, how much have you spent on the poke? You know, like just really be open. And I just, the other thing I just thought of too, I'm not Robinson Crusoe here. Like I'm just a logical person who's putting one and one together and coming up with four. Like, <laughs> um, but I, I would think there's a lot of other people, mothers, grandmothers, carers, parents, et cetera, out there sort of thinking the same thing. So I'm thinking you're story would be very uh, good in the libraries and like when I started for ingredients and to, to be honest even still I use the libraries a lot because what a library does okay they don't pay you but they promote you and what has every library got a following so every library, you know, everyone that's joined a library, they generally tend to open their newsletters. A library's newsletter open rate's really high compared to, you know, the usual ones that you get in your inbox. So, you know, and then there's your picture and your really clever, clever caption, whatever, beware of addiction or whatever. It doesn't have to be specific to just addiction in general, I think. So I don't know, they'd be another really good avenue. And then you get to sell your book, which, you know, when you can sell, um, person to person, P to P, that's the greatest amount of profit back in your pocket, you know, as the author as well. So, you know, they're a good little revenue, not only a revenue stream, but very good promoting. And you know yourself, people have got to see things four, five, six times before they go, you know what, 
I'm finally going to buy that book. I've seen it now that many times or someone's told me about it. So hey there, it's your host, Laban Ditchburn. And sorry for interrupting the video that you're watching, but I wanted to bring to your attention podcastingheroes.com. Podcastingheroes.com is a five, five minute video training series that I created, especially for you. You, if you have a podcast or you're about to start a podcast and you want to figure out a way on how to attract the highest level talent in your niche or niche, depending on where you are in the world, into your world and then develop no like, and trust so that they will then invite you into their world and inevitably into their platforms, on their platforms and to their audience. Even if you don't have a big audience, there's the caveat as well. And what I'm teaching is exactly what I've gone through in my own podcasting journey. So have a beautiful day, podcastingheroes.com. Get your free training. advice, And I'm asking this on behalf of our amazing audience because I know we've got plenty of uh, burgeoning authors or well-established authors and entrepreneurs and people that can benefit from this. Is, this is really, really genius. And this is, I think, um, part of the enjoyment factor of us being back in Australia, being back around an, an English-speaking environment because my wife and I have been around in Mexico and Colombia for about a year and a half, two oh, years ago. And as I don't speak Spanish, neither does Anna. And so I can't have these conversations with people in the supermarket and talk to them about this. And you're right, giving someone your book or selling your book and then signing your name in there if they want you to autograph it is yeah. like one of the best feelings going, right? Well, and it's theatre. People buy into you and your story. Even yesterday, we, um, you know, because we try to do a pro bono event every six weeks. So, you know, you kind of pick and choose who they are. But yesterday we did it at the for the Budrum Probus Club. Now, Probus uh, is a, a fusion of two words, professional and business. So they're all professionals that were in business and have retired. So yesterday we walked into the Budrum Bowls Club, never been before, worth a visit, beautiful greens. And we looked around and we went, jingies. The average age was probably about 85. And I just thought, you know, like I learned to cook from this group of people you know they're not buying my cookbook by the end of it not only were they buying one they were buying four books six books six seven it was incredible it was amazing the the sales that we did they bought into the story I opened the floor up to questions they were engaged it was fun it was so good it was so amazing but again right they're all people with life experience and they can see what's happening as well and they've got kids and you know when we grew up in Australia and New Zealand the only ice that we knew was the ice you put in your rum and coke <laughs> nowadays you know that's and especially in a lot of regional parts of Australia that is a scourge in society so you know, yeah, I don't know. I just think those sorts of, you might sell a lot more. A, they're going to buy into st your story. B, you are, and I've only just met you, but you're charismatic. You can hold your own. You know, you you, 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 you can tell a story and people love a story. So if you can, you know, if I'm writing something today, how do you make it benefit those whose ears it's going to fall upon? How do you make it resonate? And no one's going to sell it better than you. So be proactive with A, getting your following together and then B, the path on which you are going to need to follow to promote your book. So, you know, once I exhausted the libraries, then I actually then started going to, so you can see a lot of my later books have been endorsed. So my latest book is my 42nd book. It's due out, shameless plug. It's due my out goodness. in July and it's called Four Ingredients, More Diabetes. But, um, you know, it isn't really COVID that's the pandemic in Australia. It's diabetes mm -hmm. and not just Australia, to be honest, most of the Western mm -hmm. world. So um, I worked with Diabetes Australia for endorsement on that book. And why that is crucial is that that opens up a following of over 5 million people. So, you know, yeah, align yourself with, if it was, if I was you with your topic, with, you know, the, you know, AAs of the world and the, you know, even like, for example, those that deal with the homeless on a Friday night, you know, because they get lots of grants, they get lots of, you know, things you can, yeah, it'd be good to be able to share their books with the people that they're you know, dishing out a cup of soup too. So anyway, you know, sometimes it's the ones that need to hear and read your message can afford it the least. So yeah. how, where are the other avenues that you can tap into to be able to provide that? So 
Yeah, it's a really great advice, Kim. I appreciate that tremendously because the 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 addictions that I am have gotten free from are gambling, but also alcohol for yep. eight years in September. It'll be recreational drug use, um, sex addiction, like basically anything that I could get addicted to. I was like, you imagine if Charlie Sheen and Fear and Loathing Las Vegas made a baby. Like oh. that was that was me, and it was the gambler's helpline that was the catalyst for being heard without judgment for the first time. I talk about this early in the book. And really the book is not a finger waggling exercise. It's like, hey, here's what I did. And I managed to do it with that 12 step. I think there's a place for that, but I don't have to go to meetings. So um, for me, that's important. So, and it's already having an impact for the small number of people that it's had exposure to. So I can only imagine once it actually, once that, that overflow, the spill just expands out. It's going to take we off very need quickly. To get into schools, you know, kids 15, 16, 17 need to be hearing your story. And, you know, you're lucky, you're on the other end of it. But, like, look at that poor man that threw himself off the cruise ship last week. So, racked up a $5,000 debt in gambling on night one, had to go to his mother, cap in hand. She paid it off. But to get him back in, they gave him a $750 voucher for night two. And he thought, okay, I'll just go and spend that. Racked up another $4,000. Couldn't go back to his mother. So threw himself off the boat. That happened just last week. You need to be in schools, like sharing, you know, because all of this is coming their way. All of this is coming their way. You can access more information about more online on your in your pocket at any time than you've ever been able to in the history of mankind. So if you don't have the skill set or the knowledge to say, you know what, not really my thing. And I think the only way kids are going to do that is hearing live people who've come out the other way because for everyone that has, there's probably three that haven't. Well, gambling is one of the, like, has the highest rates of suicide out of all the addictions because of how quickly you lose it or you just... I'd never heard of that story with that guy on the cruise. Well, that's just case in, in point. The, in the news on the weekend, like it's only a fresh story. It's terrible. Look, there's lots of fluff and there's lots of excitement around this amazing journey that you've been on. I'm curious to know, Kim, like what are the what have been the moments of rock bottom in this journey? And how did you overcome them? Um, oh it's just the grind. <laughs> When you're building something, you know, it's like um, it's like a marriage, it's like parenting, it's business, you know, it's just the constant daily grind. And sometimes it can get a bit overwhelming or, you know, you can feel a little deflated. But um, I don't know, surround yourself with people that are positive, you know, surround yourself with people that are supportive. And, you know, if you've got that, like, I hire for personality, all other traits for what I do can be taught, you know. So if you've just kind of got that support, that naturally kind, supportive, amazing surround, you know, you, you can bounce really easily. You know, you have moments of, oh, my God, I didn't realise it was going to be this heavy <laughs> or hard or haven't seen my kids in 10 days or you know, the sales are down. How are we going to bump them? Oh, my God. And everything generally as the owner rests, lands squarely on your shoulders. So, you know, it's just a constant. You're constantly, but, you know, I'm very conscious um, that thankful people are happy people. And I'm very conscious to be happy because I'm blessed. I'm so blessed. I wake up, I can walk along the ocean and I find the water really soothing. I find the I take a lot of solace from that, like it levels me. So, you know, find those things in your life that help you find that equilibrium, that balance as well, because if you can find that naturally, you know, everything kind of pay, okay, sales weren't this good this month. I get to walk on the beach. I go home. I've got a fridge full of beautiful, fresh, healthy food. I've got a loving family, really. You know, you just got to remind yourself, you know, it's, it's even in those overwhelming moments, there's a lot of really good happening around you. So just remind yourself about that. Surround yourself with people that will remind you as well. I I love that. And a big fan of Jim Rohn and and a lot of the amazing um, quotes that he had about you become like the five people you spend the most time with and you earn within a few thousand dollars. And 
that's been a, a major priority in my life in terms of setting very strong boundaries, including with family members. And I'm curious to know when you were in the very, very early stages of this experience, do you remember any family members in particular that had just sat you down and said, you know what, Kim, this probably isn't a good idea? Or do you ever, ever have anyone that kind of poo pooed what you were trying to do? I know we poo pooed what we were doing, but I remember telling my mum that, you know, oh my God, you won't believe what I'm doing. She's like, what are you doing, darling? I said, I'm writing a cookbook. And she goes, oh, Bless your heart. Isn't that fantastic? Oh, wasn't it a rainy day? It just <laughs> rained so much last night. You know, like, of course you're writing a cookbook, you know. And I remember when it really started to, you know, to, to take off, um, she sat me down and said, um, as you become more of a public figure, know that there will be people out there who will want to tear you down. You know, what you are doing is not going to resonate with them. There's going to be, you know, this, that and the other. And she said, just know in your heart what you are doing. You are doing it from a good place. You know, you're genuinely wanting to help busy people get good food on the table at the end of the day. You know, so she said, hold on to that. And it was really good because, you know, for every great review, well, in four ingredients, there's probably a hundred great reviews and one terrible one, mm. you know, like our odds defy the logic sort mm -hmm. of thing. But, um, you know, she's like, don't take too much of that to heart. You know in your head and your heart what you're doing is really good. So that was very sound advice because, you know, it's very easy in 2024 to tear people down. And, you know, I started 2024 and my New Year's resolution this year was to drop a positive response on TripAdvisor once a week, um, you know, whether it was a cafe I'd gone to or a bakery or we'd stayed at a little B&B &B in Stanthorpe on our way to somewhere else, you know, that was my, because I just think if you are able to spread some kindness, some positivity, if you have had a good experience somewhere, share it. Because it's just so easy for people to go, <laughs> you know, yeah, be part of the positive, you know, the movement of positivity and kindness. And I try to, you know, then show my boys, this is what I said about this, or this is what I said about that. So, you know, and I know that they don't do that, but hopefully over time, they, they'll come away in their own little world and do that too. So I love that so much because when we were, particularly when we were traveling in the United States, I would, uh, and this is only really applicable if you're comfortable in front of the camera, but I would have a, a beautiful meal yeah. and, and you know, tipping's a big a thing in the culture over there and give a, a really generous tip to the waitress and sometimes record a video testimonial for them. See, that's amazing. If you were that waitress, you would be absolutely thrilled. You have tears, tears. I was going to say week, probably month, maybe year, you know? So I just think too, I remember we wrote a cookbook with a guy called Deepak Chopra. And I remember him saying to me, the fastest way to happiness, Kim, is to make others happy. And I just went, oh, how revolutionary. <laughs> you know, amazing, amazing piece of advice. And I just think it's so true, you know? How good did that make you feel that you made her feel so good? Oh, it's the best. It's 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 my secret um power. Power and passion. I love doing it because I I've been on the receiving end. And you know, uh probably one of my favorite chapters in the book um is called Generosity. And it was when I was six. And long story short, we grew up in, in Christchurch, New Zealand, and and mum and dad are split up and there was there was no money. We we're and we're at a private Christian school. Oh, and mum, some money. But well, mum was spending all of her um, benefit yeah, money on the on the school crazy. fees, so there wasn't much left for anything else. And uh, and we had no money for my birthday. And and I told the teacher this as she was tying my tie on on the last day, the last period of the of the day on a Friday. And um, as I was about to ride my bike nine kilometers home, Kim, she stuffs this envelope into my hand and demands me to just take it straight home and give it to my mother. Had thirty dollars in it. And it shaped my, how my generosity kind of evolved. Yeah. And in writing the book, we couldn't remember her name. So we launched this manhunt at Middleton Grange School in Christchurch and found the woman who had passed away and we were, we were devastated. And then we realized it wasn't her and she's still alive. And her and I are friends to this day. 
And she sends me these amazing little Christmas cards, like these digital Christmas cards. And, and um, it's just, just an extraordinary thing. So whilst I have some resources and the plan for me is to get FU money wealthy, not because I want to buy material stuff. I want to scale generosity. Yeah. And I can, I sense that you're like that in many oh, ways. You should get a T-shirt. Scale generosity. Oh, that's good. That's really good. Well, that was you, Mike, borrowing that one. Put that in my pocket. Thank you very much, Laban. Scale generosity. Isn't that lovely? That's a, that could be a good book as well. Yeah, it's good. Uh, I had a thought. Now that you've got a platform of sorts, have you ever thought about a transition into politics in this country? No. Why is that? Um, I've still got um, younger children and I'm very connected in my community. Like I'm, um, you know, and I do a lot for my community, which isn't just where I live, but my region, Sunshine Coast as well. You know, I've sat on a lot of Sunshine Coast boards and, um, you know, sat on a community reference group for the Biosphere nomination for six years, still working with that. So I do a lot. It's very important for me to give back. Um, but I don't, I sort of, I feel like my husband and I, we've just been on this amazing four-week trip to India. And I just, I've got parents, in-laws in their 80s and parents in their 70s. And, you know, my dad is terminal with cancer. It's really horrible because we're an extremely close family. And um, I just said to my hubby, we're in our sort of mid-50s. I said, I sort of see this next 15 years as our adventure years, you know, and talking to beautiful Anna and she's telling me about this silly um, island she comes from, the, the capital is Dolukalala. Sakhalin <laughs> Island, Sakhalin Island. <laughs> and I still don't even know every country in our, on our planet, you know. And I just think, what would be there we could discover? I wonder do they eat? deal you know like all these things and I just think we've sort of got this next 15 years to go to these amazing places and where we can we've got knees that will elevate us onto the backs of elephants or camels or you know backs that will allow us to sleep in tents in the far desert you know whereas after that I sort of see us probably more on the cruise ships at bingo you know <laughs> a little bit more sedate so I just kind of feel like I'm winding down to become a bit more, you know, once our youngest is out of school in another two years, like I really sort of want my husband and I, while we're able to, you know, I want to be out of the country for four months of the year. Yeah. And I just think, you know, um, politics is a life of service and you really have to commit to that. And I just don't think I have as much as I will always support and I will, you know, I'm volunteer on polling day and I'm the first at the bake sale and sticking up the flag, you know, that I, always happy to do that just don't think I have the heart to commit what is needed anymore when I sort of yeah like you know you talking about Medellin in Colombia and telling me it's actually gentrified I'm like what the I'm expecting Pablo Escobar everybody you know, <laughs> his offspring and blah 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 so you know how exciting would it be to go there but I'm probably not going to want to do that in my 70s I'm probably going to want to do that in the next decade it's a very good point. And, and just side note that uh, the suburb in Laurelis, uh, called Laurelis, which is where we lived in Medellin, was voted by Forbes magazine in 2023 as the coolest neighbourhood in the world. What makes it cool? The, um, drug, the drugs or? So the, the, the cartels, are, they still exist in some smaller capacity, but Pablo Escobar died in the 90s. Yeah. So it was, and it was voted the most dangerous city in the world in the 80s and 90s, early yeah. 1990s. But there's been a huge governmental improvement. Oh, and, oh, yeah. Street art, is it pretty streets? Is it's it cafes? 1,500 metres above sea level oh. in the mountains. It's green and slush. Oh. There's so much uh, plants and everything everywhere. It's stunning. Coffee, coffee beans. Oh, my. Beans. Some of the best coffee you've ever had. Amazing. And the people are incredible. Really friendly. Super well, friendly. Yeah. Tourist trade down there. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Like, lots, lots of people come from people America, there. Canada. And what they've done is second to Bali, it's become the second most popular uh, um, digital nomad destination. So the government hands out 
12 month dig, uh, nomad visas so you can come and not have to go in and out and you can set up a bank account locally and get a local sim card and do really? it oh, yeah 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 oh, see there you go you know so yeah i mean that was lls long story short yeah probably no <laughs> politics because i want to go to towns like that as you should too yeah. and we kind of glossed over it but you, you said you did a collaboration with deep back chopra which is which is a big bloody deal folks yeah, it was a what was deal what was the what was the, what was the collab after having written a book no publisher wanted to publish, within a year every publisher wanted four ingredients and um, we sort of become really good friends with a lot of them and um, one of them, Leon Maxon, headed up Hay House Australia and was very good friends with Louise Hay, Dr Wayne Dwyer, Deepak Chopra and he could see, you know, like uh, really a bestseller in four ingredients, fast, fresh and healthy where we take that Ayurvedic model mm-hmm. of eating and diet and whatnot. And it was interesting and it was innovative for Australia. Like we couldn't even spell Ayurvedic, you know, so it I'll was. Still count. Yeah, well, I'd have to you know, go into the recesses of my memory as well. But um, it was very exciting. So every book I've ever published of the 42 titles, that is the only one in Australia that is published and it is published by Hay House. But that was the only way we could get DPAC. But once you get DPAC, you get DPAC not just in Australia, you get DPAC globally. So it was a very calculated collaboration on our behalf. It was just smart. And see, after three years of self-publishing in Australia, um, we could see online because, you know, social media is starting to get stronger and stronger. Oh, why don't you sell your book in England? Sell your book in the States? Sell your book, da 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 Canada. So we tendered our business for um, joint venture deal in Australia to, you know, Penguin and Random House and Simon and & Schuster, Allen and & Unwin, all the big ones. And we ended up, um, we loved the uh, offer from Simon & Schuster, who we still work with now. And it was a joint venture, not a traditional publishing deal. But we needed that because that was a springboard that got us a seven book deal with Simon and Schuster in the United States. So, you know, the statistics of who gets a publishing deal, even when you are an American citizen in the United States, are very, very low. It's almost impossible when you're a foreigner, let alone a seven book deal. So, yeah, I know. So, you know, like we were quite strategic with who we partnered with when we partnered and the reasons why. So having a finance slash business background has been invaluable with the growth of four ingredients over time. And there's another little point, you know, surround yourselves with, um, you know, people with business acumen. So your financial planners, your, your accountant, your solicitor, because they have your back, but like I push them, I push them. I'm like, no, I'm not paying that amount of tax. Let's find other other areas. Let's, you know, no one looks after your finances better than you. And we work so hard to accumulate, you know, so hang on to every cent of it as much as you possibly can. But that's only going to come with good advice. And then you, you know, constantly, is that the best we can do? Surely we can do better than that, you know. So constantly be challenging the experts in your life for a better result for you too. That is wonderful advice. Uh, one of the former guests was Mark Victor Hansen. Oh, Mark Victor, Chicken, Chicken soup, soup for the Soul. Who also endorsed my book. We've had Jack Canfield on as well, but they, they've sold 600 plus million copies. Yes, yes I'm coming for you. <laughs> <laughs> but the majority of them, I think 400 plus million is in China. Have you explored the Chinese market? Uh, So we actually were lucky enough in 2018 to go to a province of China called Yantai, where we took out um, a global award at the Gourmand Cookbook Awards for the biggest selling book of the year. And it was the slow cooker book that I wrote. So that was just amazing. It was just amazing. And we sort of were on that path. But then in 2000, you know, in 19, that allowed us then we were invited by the Gorman Society to cook on stage underneath the Eiffel Tower yes. um, in Paris. You know, so here's everyone with their, you know, go, uh, cordon bleu. They've got medals and white shirt. And here I am in my pink dress and my pink apron. And But I tell you what, my apricot balls slayed everyone. Those French, <laughs> they were running from the valleys and the hills to get three-ingredient apricot balls. So 
But, um, you know, by the time then uh, the real discussion started, it was 2020. And I mean, all everything just shut down with China. And to be honest, we've through COVID, you know, uh, we've never spent more time in proximity to our kitchen as we have in 2020, 2021. And the demand I wrote uh, the easiest air fryer cookbook ever, still the biggest air frying, you know, selling cookbook in the country. I wrote uh, the easiest pie maker book ever, still hugely possible, um, popular. I wrote four ingredients veggie vegan because through COVID, the first two years, the average Australian put on 3.3 kilos. So then we all want to go plant-based to try and trim. So then I wrote keto, four ingredients. So it just went on. And so it's been so busy here that I haven't really gone back to, you know, even looking at it. but imagine it i don't know how it would translate in china well, the ingredients i mean gosh they're grinding four herbs before they even started with the protein let alone a vegetable well i look they they ended up in the schooling system oh they so uh i think maybe the primary or high school i'm not sure which one but yeah. that was the yeah, to the best yeah. of my knowledge and uh obviously a huge market so yeah. Just food for thought. But the other question I had for you, Kim, was around um, more the um, self-help genre. Like if you thought about doing a four ingredients to mental health or to resilience or to um, gratitude or anything along those lines. <laughs> relationships <laughs> i don't think you need a book for that just two words two words if everyone could just adopt these two words you would have that anyway and that is be kind that's it you heard it here that's first, it here's folks you've no you've heard it a million times <laughs> you know knowledge of power when you do something with it isn't it so even me sometimes you know like my husband annoys me my kids annoy me you know and you've just got to take a breath and you've got to be mentally psych yourself into the next words that come out of my mouth will they harm or hurt or will they be helpful you know so yeah I'm not perfect either but I try to if we could just be kind so and you know once you have a successful brand which four ingredients is like you know one in six homes in Australia now has a copy nearly everyone or a lot that you meet know about four ingredients what you've got to really you can't just take that for granted. So then you've got to work out strategies to stay relevant. So, you know, it, it's a, just a constant, it's just a, con, you know, it leaves little time for, you know, so although we have done, we have, you know, had really great apps. We've had, um, you know, a whole range of different hardware across all the different DDSs over the times, you know, we've got tea towels and aprons and hats and, I, you know, through all of this, I've now sort of, you know, I've become a speaker as well, which, you know, I never really set out on that journey, but that's kind of happened as well. So, you know, a, a lot of, a lot's going on already. And then, you know, you constantly just seem to be working on the next title. Like currently we've just sort of put the lid on four ingredients, more diabetes. And now everyone's asking me for a book about FODMAPs. So FODMAP is an acronym for all the sugars, zinc, fructose, oligosaccharide, disaccharide, monosaccharide, et cetera, et cetera. So, you know, that's really interesting. I find that really interesting. So, you know, yeah. And when there's only one of you and you still want to enjoy life, you just got to find that balance, haven't you? So, yeah, I mean, yeah. I, now that I have verbalized the question and you've shared it back with me it makes perfect sense why you're on the path that you're on trying to take to on be enjoyed it's such a gift like I just think you know don't let work stress you out yeah take that extra day off take that holiday book we always as a family have a holiday book because it gives you something to look forward to it gives you something to talk about together to plan together to save for because I refuse to be the major sponsor of every family holiday now that the boys <laughs> are working so you know it gives you something to you know, brings you together as well. But I think, no, life is very much to be. And when you can enjoy life, that's it makes you happy and, you know, makes you thankful and it keeps the hard work required to sustain a business. I don't know, it just keeps it all balanced or level or enjoyable. If it was all work, it would be unenjoyable. If it was all play, it would be dull. <laughs> Maybe not, but you know. <laughs> no, it would be. It would be. It wouldn't be any fulfillment component. So, and on that note, how do people get a hold of you? 
So um, we are across all social media, you know, platforms. So probably we're most prevalent on Facebook and Instagram to a lesser degree, Pinterest, although we have a beautiful Pinterest page and TikTok. But, um, and you can like, honestly, we have published my number, beautiful Mel, my brand manager who you've met, her mobile number, they're all over the website. We love a chat, pick up our phone, you know, we just get, don't get Mel because she'll ring for one book and invariably she'll sell you six and you won't even know <laughs> she's done it. So warning, warning, but she's just beautiful, sweeter than maple syrup. So, um, you know, info at four ingredients, Kim at four ingredients, Melinda at four ingredients. Once you go searching, we're like a rash, you'll find us everywhere. <laughs> Do you have any concluding thoughts for our amazing audience today, Kim? Oh, I probably overwhelmed you with too much as it is, but, um, you know, if there's anyone out there that we can help through what we've learned ourselves, just reach out, reach out via you or reach out, just Google four ingredients and you'll find us. But I um, can't tell you how many people that we've sort of mentored in terms of writing books and, you know, people are so consumed by that singular um, task that they're not building their following simultaneously that is critical crucial you cannot do that and then once you have your book you will realize you know as much time sweat and tears went into every page every word italics this bold that that's nothing that's 20 percent of the journey you have to harness the art of marketing because you have to be no one sells your product better than you you know and you have to you have to be able to you know, share the benefit of it really quickly to a large amount of people for cut through. So, you know, here to help anyone who needs help along the way. Ladies and gentlemen, Kim Petoska. Thanks so much for having me. Good luck with whatever it is you're trying to achieve. Okay, are you ready to go? Ready. All right. What am I going to say at the very beginning? Hello. <laughs>